Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, today we have a special episode on a very relevant topic for all of us, and that is vaccine hesitancy. Now, vaccine hesitancy is a reluctance or refusal to be vaccinated or to have one's children vaccinated against contagious diseases. People who conform to this view are commonly known as anti-vaxxers, and this term encompasses outright refusal to vaccinate, delaying of vaccines, or accepting vaccines but remaining uncertain about their use or using certain vaccines but not others. The arguments against vaccination are contradicted by overwhelming scientific consensus about the safety and efficacy of vaccines, and the World Health Organization views vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 global health threats. Hesitancy primarily results from public debates around medical, ethical, and legal issues related to vaccines. It stems from multiple key factors, including a person's lack of confidence or mistrust for the vaccine or healthcare provider, complacency, or the convenience of not getting vaccinated. It's existed since the invention of vaccination and even predates the coining of the term vaccine by nearly 80 years. Vaccine hesitancy often results in disease outbreaks and deaths from vaccine-preventable diseases, or in the case of COVID-19, there could be a continuation of the pandemic, particularly given the effectiveness of the vaccines to date. So today we're dedicating an episode to the topic of vaccine hesitancy and hearing from experts who know the right information. Quite often the argument from those who are vaccine hesitant is to do the research. But as an epidemiologist who spent my entire life studying how to critically appraise research, I know that being able to assess how reliable the information you read is, is just as important as finding a variety of perspectives. So today we have two experts on the show. First, we have Dr. Rod Russell, who's a professor of virology and immunology at the Munn Medical School, who was on the show last week. Our conversation was longer than I had time for, so we're going to include the full chat in today's episode. And next, we have Dr. Deborah Kelly, who's an associate professor of pharmacy and medicine and special advisor of practice innovation for Eastern Health. She joined me via Zoom for the second part of the show. This is an important topic for everybody who wants to be informed with the right information. Let's pick up where we left off last week with Dr. Rod Russell. Hi, Dr. Russell. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem. It's, it's been great. I know you've been very busy lately. Uh, you study immunology and vaccine development. Uh, can you give us a bit of background on what your research area is and, and how it all works? Yeah, so we've been studying viruses. Um, in my lab, we've been, we've been studying hepatitis C virus for many years, looking at, primarily we were looking at, you know, how the virus replicates what I call target discovery. So trying to find places on the virus and within the virus life cycle to, to develop drugs against. More recently, we've gotten into in, inflammasome stuff. So the in, inflammation that viruses cause and how they cause pathogenesis in the tissues they infect. So when the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic hit and, and we saw this massive inflammation in the lungs, I, you know, I saw right away that this was something familiar and probably similar to what we see with hep C in the liver. So we, we got right into it. That's excellent. And I know you've been busy doing interviews in a lot of different places. Uh, one of the things I think is really important for people to understand is how do vaccines work and, and how does immunology work in general? So the, the whole idea of vaccines and immunology is to sort of give the immune system a taste of, of what might be to come. So the idea, it, it's like the immunizations that we get it as kids. Um, the, the immune system can be trained. So it's, it's always ready to respond and react to whatever bug or pathogen, bacteria, virus it comes at it. But, you know, some of these are nasty and can do a lot of damage before the immune system has, has a chance to respond to them. So the idea, of course, behind vaccines is that you, you give the immune system a little bit of the, the bug or a lot of the bug in some cases. Um, and then you make a response so that when you get exposed later, your immune system already has antibodies, T cells, memory B cells, memory T cells that are there ready to respond faster and stronger than they would if it was the first time they saw the, the bug. Right. So it's almost like watching film of the pitcher you're about to you go bad against uh, to know what their pitches look like before they come. Exactly. Okay. Do your homework. <laughs> right. And, and one of the reasons why this vaccine was developed so quickly is there was a new technology or new, a new approach used, um, and it was called RNA vaccines. Uh, what's, what does that mean for the future of vaccines? I, yeah, I think that actually might, I think the RNA vaccines might be the future of vaccines. 
Um, when I, I teach vaccines, I've been teaching vaccines for years. And back quite a while ago now, when the Canadian government announced that they had pre-ordered vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, I had an interview coming up on, on CBC. And um, I knew that I'd be asked about these vaccines and what kind of vaccines they were. So I went and did, you know, did my homework. And the first thing I found is that they were RNA vaccines. And I thought, well, that must be a mistake because I teach vaccines and I don't talk about RNA vaccines. I didn't know what an RNA vaccine was. And I thought it must just be, you know, the, there may be RNA in the vaccine uh, that would normally be made, you know, a viral vaccine like we always talk about. But no, I found out they were actually RNA vaccines. So I had to educate myself and realize that you know, these are literally pieces of RNA. So there's no viral vector. There's no infectious part or anything in there. It's literally a bit of RNA that makes the spike protein wrapped up in a, a nanoparticle that's basically lipids or, or fats. And it's it's why they're safe, I think, and why they're working so well is because the it's RNA-based. So they, so they really permeate into the cell and the RNA actually it gives instructions to the cell to develop the immune response that it needs, correct? Yes. So basically, you know, our cells make RNA um, to make our own proteins. And so what happens with these vaccines is the, the RNA gets taken into the cells and it gets read by our cells. The, the RNA is a code to make proteins and the proteins are the functional units of everything in our body, really. So the, what happens then is the RNA is the code that makes the protein, and then the immune system says, you don't belong here. Mm. It, it recognizes right away that it doesn't recognize it and says, you're foreign. We don't, we've never seen you before because your immune system is educated to know our own proteins, our own parts of our body, and not to react against them, unless, of course, you have autoimmunity, which is the definition of autoimmunity, that we react, re react against ourselves. But normally, the immune system says, okay, that spike protein that was just made from that piece of RNA, that doesn't belong here, antibodies, T-cell responses, reaction. So then you get your primary response. And then later, you get your booster if you get a second shot, or if you get the vaccine, uh, the virus, then you make a response against it. Hmm. So it's almost like the cells are practicing being able to create the, the immune response to fight off the virus if it ever enters our system. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. But, yeah, but the point is the immune response, the first response, the second response. So when it actually sees the virus later, the second response or third response, if it's two boosters and then a virus exposure, the, each subsequent response is stronger than the ah, first one. Right. So it gets better and better over time. Um, how are they able to manufacture the the specific RNA that makes it produce these proteins? Um, that, I mean, we've been doing that for years. We do that in the lab. It's, it's a simple technique where you, you know, you have a, a piece of DNA that is the code you want to make the, the RNA of, and, you know, you can literally purchase, you know, enzymes that will make the RNA for our, our own research. We, we do it in the lab ourselves. Um, the, the technology for vaccines has actually been around for about 10 years, but, but like many things in science, new things can take a long time to, to get accepted. And I think there was this sort of, oh, you're crazy, you can't make a vaccine out of RNA, and, and sort of, it, it really didn't get, I think it was the scientific community probably didn't accept it very fast, but mm. uh, it, it's been accepted now. And, and I, I actually do think that because the RNA vaccines are faster to make, and because you, you literally just have to enter the sequence into a computer and the machine spits out the, the, the strands of RNA of whatever sequence you want, it'll be the fastest way to make vaccines. Wow. Um, and the, the most important thing, in my opinion, is the world right now is worried about variants. So with an RNA vaccine, you just change the sequence that you enter into the computer. And today you have the wild type, tomorrow you have the variant. Wow. I envision a day when we have a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine that has two, three, four different variants in the same, same, same injection. Right. And I, so I think that's one of the hesitancy people have, and we could talk a little bit about vaccine hesitancy, but you know, people have been like, they've been able to develop this vaccine so quickly and I don't trust it. Um, you know, I think you've helped clarify it with some of that, but you know, what would you tell people when it comes to the vaccine hesitancy side of things and whether or not the research was done thoroughly? I would say, as I said, that, the whole idea of these RNA vaccines has been around for many years. It's just that it hadn't been used in, you know, in a mass production style. But as far as safety goes, and that was sort of where I, I figured I'd get questions about safety right away. So when I originally went digging to see what these RNA vaccines were, you know, it, I realized it was a, a lipid nanoparticle, which has actually been used 
Uh, nanoparticles have been used in cancer treatment for at least 10 years. Many cancer treatments that we have out there, not RNA-based cancer treatments, but the actual um, chemicals or the, the, the chemotherapy, if it's mixed up in a nanoparticle, it actually works better and has less side effects in many cases. So the nanoparticle stuff is is not a safety concern at all. And the RNA, um, in my opinion, you know, a little piece of RNA is is going to get degraded after a few days in your body, whereas usually people are scared of vaccines because they know it's live attenuated, so it's a weakened version of an actual virus, or it's um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which does work well and is safe, but theoretically it is a, a recombinant virus, so it's an infectious virus that brings the, the, the spike protein or the DNA for the spike protein in. But it's still a virus, and people may fear it because it's a virus, but the RNA, vi- RNA vaccines are just little bits of RNA. We're talking vaccine hesitancy with Dr. Rod Russell, professor and researcher of virology and immunology. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're talking vaccine hesitancy with Dr. Rod Russell, professor and researcher of virology and immunology. Let's get back to the interview. This virus has changed faster than anybody has predicted. Why did that happen? And, you know, I think you explained how we're, we're potentially able to set up defenses by using these new types of vaccines, but, but why did it evolve so quickly? That's a great question. Um, I mean, we, it's not surprising that, that this virus mutated. RNA viruses like to mutate. It's part of their normal artillery, we'll say. You know, vi- RNA viruses... All viruses live in a, in a host, in a human or animal or whatever. All viruses live in another another uh, living being. So they've adapted. They've had to face immune systems through all time, through evolution or whatever you believe in. But basically, they, they always have to survive in the face of an immune system. So what RNA viruses have done, all of them, is they've, they've basically learned to be sloppy when they replicate. So they, they intentionally make mistakes. They all do it. So it's funny for me right now because in some ways people are kind of surprised that this virus is mutating, but any virologist will tell you that's what they do. HIV does it, flu does it, hep C does it. All RNA viruses mutate. Some mutate faster than others. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that it mutated. Now, I'll be the first to say I didn't think it would mutate this fast. Mm -hmm. When I was first talking about this virus, I thought, it might mutate by next year. So we could get a vaccine this year, and this flu season, we'll say, is when these viruses typically come around. I thought we'd – I didn't think it would change this fast, but it's changing within one season. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why it's been difficult to handle because it's – I had been saying, get a vaccine, take care of us this year, worry about next year, next year. But next mm. year came this, this year. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, is it potentially because so many people were infected, so there's more of an opportunity for it to transmit, change, and evolve as it went through so many people? Definitely. That's one of the factors. Um, you know, these things mutate as they spread, and they mutate as they replicate. So, you know, any virus that, in, that can infect 100 million people is having a lot of opportunity to, to mutate, spread. And, you know, it's, it's really survival of the fittest. It's, it's Darwinian genetics mm-hmm. in a micro sphere, right? Yeah. It's, it's the the strongest will will compete and outcompete very quickly. So as soon as you get a mutation that grows a little bit better or spreads a little bit better or evades the immune system a little bit better, that one will quickly take over, as we've seen now in parts of Canada where the variants, you know, in Newfoundland, we kind of had no virus, and then we had a variant show up. But in other parts of the world or the country, we're seeing a, a shift now where they had the older version, and then the, the variant was introduced and now is taking over mm-hmm. um, and dominating. And it, it, tra- it transmits faster, and sometimes viruses become less fatal because the host stays alive longer. Because they, you know, That's true. it's yeah. no good for yeah, a virus. You have to remember, viruses don't want to kill us. No, they actually want to survive. They want they want to su- survive with us, whether that's in our body or in our population. But they are trying to survive. They're not trying to get rid of us. Right, right. So they evolve and they find out what works best for the host as well. Um, you know, let's get philosophical for a second here. Uh, <laughs> because I think it just, I can't think of anything. And I know you can't either. Like they can shut the entire world down like this. Like, I mean, you know, you got wars, whatever that's in a part or a region or a specific city or whatever, but like, you know, this has shut the whole world down. Um, you know, can this happen again? Of course it can happen again. It's mind blowing that it happened at all. I mean, I can remember being during my postdoctoral training, being in a lecture by one of the top, 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 
uh, flu virus researchers who was studying the 1918 Spanish flu variant and trying to figure out why that flu virus became a pandemic and what, whereas others don't. And I remember, you know, those guys in that field, they always said it could happen again. It could happen again. And every grant that they would write would say it could happen again. It just takes one virus to, to mutate or recombine with another or for a zoonotic transfer to happen like like has happened here now where a virus in a bat makes it into a human and, and wreaks havoc. So we always knew it could happen. But honestly, I don't think anyone ever thought that it would happen at this magnitude. And that got me thinking, you know, what else could do this? Because in the first lockdowns, when you're sitting at home, you can't even see your neighbors. You can't go see your family. And you, you have to explain to your four-year-old why she can't see nanny. You know, it's it's heartbreaking. And it, it hit me that I, don't, I can't think of anything else that could do this. Mm-hmm. And because mm-hmm. even even in the infectious diseases world, bacteria won't really stop the world because they don't spread as fast. You know, it's something that can be sneezed and something that doesn't make you that sick, in my opinion. So Ebola is the nastiest virus on the planet. Right. Right. But everyone knows if you have Ebola. Yes. So in a way, part of the reason we have a pandemic here is because this virus is not making everyone really, really sick. Mm-hmm. Which that gives it opportunity to spread. Right, because if you got Ebola, even SARS was uh, quite pronounced symptoms, correct? Which is why yeah. it was able to be yeah. controlled. But this, yeah. again, there's a lot of people that were uh, that had no uh, no side effects, but they could still transmit. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the other side of things is people are hesitant of a vaccine, um, and it's really important that we get a large proportion of the population immunized in order for this to be able to stop the pandemic. Is it stronger than you thought it was going to be? The hesitancy. Yes, unfortunately, it is. I really, from the beginning, I, I sort of, I was, honestly, I was a little bit skeptical that we would have vaccines as fast as we did mm-hmm. because I, you know, I was sort of, I thought 18 months, two years, you know, but it was the massive global effort, of course, and, and the, the application of every kind of technology we had that made it happen faster than we thought. But when the vaccines were coming, when we knew they were coming, I, I was overjoyed, of course, but I, I really thought that, you know, this what was going to save the world was the vaccines. What was going to get us back to normal was that, you know, vaccine will come and everybody was calling for it. Everybody was, you know, when are the vaccines coming? When are the vaccines coming? There was this sort of global pressure to hurry up and get the vaccines out. And then they came. And then it's almost like as soon as we got what we wanted, we didn't want it, you know? So mm-hmm. then the, then we had the hesitancy and now the, the numbers, of course, the, you know, the 95 versus the 65 and people saying, Oh, I'm going to wait for the good one. You know, it's, it's unfortunate now that we have the solution to the problem and people are reluctant to, to, to engage it. It blows my mind. Well, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the research side because this is the world we're in. And so we've looked at clinical trials that were really quite large, 40,000 people, but then you look at the world and there's hundreds of millions of people that have been vaccinated. Where do we put our faith in the data at this point? Yeah, we have to put our faith in the real world data. Uh, it, the numbers wise, it, if you added up all of the people who were vaccinated in clinical trials and compared to them to the 360 million, when I checked three or four days ago, it's probably mm-hmm. over 400 million now. Um, people have been vaccinated uh, in the world. It's the real world data just massively outweighs and trumps the, the clinical trial data. So the numbers that we all are sort of fixated on now the 95s you know for the rnas versus the 60 odds you know for the astrazeneca and j and j um if these numbers don't matter I, i've been trying to say for a while now that we had to forget about these numbers because they were they were you know controlled little trials where um you know people were monitored closely but in the real world the, the numbers are actually looking better which is phenomenal Mm-hmm. One thing that we can talk about as well is like you've got real world areas like Israel, for example, where they've got a hundred percent immunization rate. The U.S. is starting to catch up as well. Why would we look to populations like that to see how effective these vaccines are? That's the answer. I mean, the biggest question right now, and for months now, and and even when the vaccines first came, I was a little frustrated that the the discussion around the vaccines was was so negative because. You know, people who were hesitant about the vaccines or even against vaccines were saying, well, these vaccines don't actually, they're not really vaccines. They just reduce symptoms. Mm -hmm. And and that really frustrated me because symptoms are being reduced because the vaccines are doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I believe that they are actually preventing infection. I believe they will prevent transmission. But we can't say that yet because we just don't have the data. But what you just mentioned, Israel, 
U.S., places where we're having really high um, proportions of the population vaccinated, we're about to see it. If, if you call me back on, on your show in a month, I mm-hmm. think we'll already see data that clearly says cases are, are going down, actual infections are going down, and, and transmission is going down because mm-hmm. it has to happen. If mm-hmm. symptoms are going down, if, if, if severe disease is being decreased, then, then you will see um, reduced transmission. I'm sure of it. But we, yeah. we, we can't say it right now because we just don't have the, the data that shows it yet. Exactly. And, and people aren't being tested is the problem. We're, we're still monitoring symptoms. We're not always going out and testing the people who got the vaccines to make sure they never got the virus. And you can't do that at, at, when you're vaccinating millions of people a day. Well, that's right. And also we're looking at the people that have the most uh, likely outcomes that could be severe. They're being vaccinated first. So that's one of the numbers we should see is mortality and, and severe cases dropping uh, if those vulnerable populations are getting taken care of first. And we're already seeing that. We're seeing mm-hmm. long-term care facilities now with no no infections. And we're seeing um, you know whole groups of people with no infections because the vaccines are having that effect. But we still, like I said, we still don't have the, the actual data that says they're stopping infection. We do in some cases, and there's a few studies where they actually gave, for example, healthcare workers uh, the vaccine and then actually tested them every two weeks, and they mm-hmm. saw that they weren't getting infected. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, so when it comes to the vaccine and people, you know, getting the vaccine, you know, sometimes there's a really, really strong line in the sand where people are like no or yes when it comes to vaccines. This seems to be a bit different. Are you seeing that too, that there's there's kind of a more of a gray area this this time around? Yeah, it's something I've never really noticed before. And I guess it's because, you know, I've never been in a pandemic before where there was a vaccine <laughs> available within uh, 18 months. But yeah, it's it's funny. We, we always had, um, you know, a group of people who were against vaccines in general. Uh, and then we always had people like myself who, you know, philosophically support vaccines and get the flu shot because, you know, I believe they work. I believe they're safe and I believe it's, you know, publicly responsible to get them. But I'm seeing now what I call the, the slight left and the slight right. Uh, and this, these are two different groups of people where you have people who traditionally might not have gotten the flu shot because for whatever reason they didn't think they needed to. Um, I'm seeing those people start to ask, maybe I should get this vaccine because this is not, you know, we know the flu. We get the mm-hmm. flu. We know if we can handle it or not. We know it's, um, you know, which age group is, is affected by it. But I'm seeing people say, well, I don't know. This this virus, it, sure, it affects older people more, but there's always young people and some really young people who have actually, you know, died from this infection. So nobody wants to take that risk. But then I've also seen the other side where people who were traditionally for the vaccines are actually scared and it's legitimate. You know, this all happened fast. You know, we have RNA vaccines that we had never heard of. Even I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. So I'm even seeing people who were always very pro vaccine be a little concerned now. And, and it's because, it is happening fast. I'm getting personal messages, friends, family, colleagues saying, what do you think? I trust you. Is it safe for me to go and get these RNA vaccines? And mm-hmm. I'm like, of course I say yes. But it's it's interesting to see the two new groups emerge now, the slightly for and the slightly against, because they're – and those – it's interesting. Those are the people who are actually thinking about this, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're mm-hmm. not just going with their traditional feeling about vaccines. They're actually wondering and questioning and trying to figure it out. And I think it's great that you have people – on your show talk about this because those people can formulate their own opinion based on hearing discussions like this. Exactly. And hearing you talk about why it was developed so quickly, why the world was able to get together, what data we should be trusting. This is all stuff that I think is really important for people because they want to be informed about their health, but it, it's very reassuring hearing about this from, from somebody like yourself. You know, one last question again, on the philosophical lens of things, what's changed forever? Do you think? Cause like, it's almost like a nine 11 thing where travel changed. What, what do you think has ever changed forever? Oh, I don't know. It depends. I think there's many levels um, from, from, on a personal level, you know, I think a lot of people are going to wear masks on planes now all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I never wore masks on a plane. I think I probably will now because, A, you know, this virus was circulating in the population before we knew about it. So you could have been sitting on a plane next to somebody infecting with it before it was even documented. I mean, travel happens every day, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea that, you know, the other thing is we know now better than ever how well masks work. So I never wore masks on a plane. And, you know, and lots of people say, oh, every time I, I fly, I get sick. Well, the the fact that we have so little flu around right now tells me that, you know what, <laughs> masks uh, will keep you from getting the flu. So I'm always going to wear masks on a plane now. So that's a little personal thing. On a bigger level, um, I don't know. You know, 
if we stick on the masks idea, I also thought it was strange when I saw people wearing masks in public. But there'll be no judgment anymore. And is is one thing I think on a bigger scale. You know, I think now some people will stop wearing masks as soon as they can, but some, you know, are going to keep doing it. And that's okay. And the point is I don't think anyone will judge them now because we know what could be out there. And and the fact that none of us had immunity against it is, is why we're in the situation we're in. So back to your first question, I always thought that this could happen, but I never expected you know, a virus to enter our species that we had no immunity against, that it would literally force us all to hide in our houses. Right. I, I, it's, it's interesting. If anybody's ever traveled to Asia before, when people are sick, they wear a mask to protect other people. And right. I know for a fact that if I'm not feeling well, I'll have a mask on to avoid spreading uh, to somebody else that may not be wearing a mask in public. So yeah, I feel like it. And I also think it sounds like the vaccine and the development of it will change forever. Undoubtedly, there may be some hesitation with the expediency of this development, but going forward, people won't find it unusual for a vaccine to be developed in short order. If, if this is successful. Yeah. I think that, you know, these, until this happened, you know, the, um, the four years was the record for a vaccine being developed Mm -hmm. and everybody sort of reminded everyone of that when, when we started talking about, you know, COVID-19 vaccines. But uh, yeah, I think, I think we can, we've proven that we can do it faster now. And uh, as I said, the, the RNA vaccines may actually be even faster than the others. I know there's already people looking into doing HIV, hep C, all the other ones that we don't have vaccines against. They're already looking at, the, at that. They were already looking at it. It's just that they weren't getting the um, interest and in, in, in credibility that they have now. Well, it could be a big step change for a lot of the things in your world. It sounds like you're going to be busy researching for a long time. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. I love doing that. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. I learned a lot during this interview. So thanks for taking that, taking the time in your busy schedule. Thanks for having me on. Happy to do it. We're talking vaccine hesitancy in today's episode. When we come back, we'll talk with Dr. Deborah Kelly, professor of pharmacy at Memorial University. She'll share more about the various vaccines, the development process, and what pharmacists are recommending here at home. We'll be right back. Welcome back. In this half of the show, we'll talk with Dr. Deborah Kelly, who's a professor of pharmacy and medicine at Memorial University and special advisor to Eastern Health. She shared what we need to know about the scientific process around vaccine development, the efficacy of vaccines available in Canada, and what pharmacists are recommending. Let's check it out. Hi, Dr. Kelly. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Well, thanks for coming here today. It's so important to have somebody from your perspective, and that's from the pharmacy perspective, to talk about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. You're at Memorial University. Can you tell me a bit about what you do there? So I'm an associate professor um, in the School of Pharmacy, and uh, so I teach pharmacy students and I teach medical students, but I'm also a clinician researcher, so I study a lot about medications and appropriate use, and I run a clinic that the School of Pharmacy has, which is called the Medication Therapy Services Clinic, which is designed to help people with complex medication-related issues. And we're looking forward to offering COVID vaccination clinics as soon as we're able to administer the vaccines in pharmacies. Well, we found the right person to talk to then today. You would teach people about all the new drugs coming out. You talk about the research and, and educate the people that will be administering these, these drugs to different populations. The biggest thing I think that people are concerned about right now with the expediency of the vaccines that come out is how do we know that vaccines are safe by the time they get in the hands of the public? Yeah, that's a great question because, I mean, we certainly saw things happen very, very quickly this year. But, you know, I think what we need to remember is that the reason why things happen quickly to get a vaccine against COVID is because we already had the technology in the pipeline. Scientists were working on this mRNA vaccine technology and the adenovirus technology um, we've been using for years with other things. And it was just a matter of everybody rowing the boat together. Lots of money went into this to expedite things, but no corners were cut. We have experienced experience now with over 600 million people who received the COVID vaccinations. So we've got a lot of experience that tells us that the vaccines are safe. And before they actually got into people's arms, they underwent quite rigorous study and review processes prior to approval for sale and administration in Canada and elsewhere. 
Right. And I think that's one of the things that people sometimes don't understand is how clinical trials work and the rigor, because not all research is the same quality as other studies. So, for example, these clinical trials that are done, what's the process that that these drugs have to go through in order to be approved? Yeah, so um, originally when a scientist is, is exploring a target um, or a potential drug or vaccine, they study it in animals to see how it's going to behave. And once they believe that they've got a good candidate to go forward, they conduct studies that, that ensure that it actually works in people and in healthy volunteers and also safety studies to make sure that it doesn't cause more harm than benefit. And that, those studies are done in hundreds of people. And once they demonstrate both efficacy and safety and figure out sort of what the right dose is that they want to pursue, then the trials go forward into these sort of larger multi-site clinical trials that involve thousands and thousands of patients. So these would be people enrolled that you're hoping to be candidates for receiving the vaccine. And these are studied for months to see what the impact is going to be. After they get that data, they basically put together a submission package, and that goes before each country has its own approval process. So here in Canada, Health Canada makes that review. So they would look at the entire submission package, review both the efficacy and the safety data. Sometimes they go back and they ask for additional information or clarification, but it's not until they, they're feeling satisfied with our own experts and scientists within Health Canada that all of those thresholds have been met is when they will finally approve that product for sale and administration in Canada. And even once it's approved and we start using it in practice, we actually continue to learn a lot about these products because we do something called post-marketing surveillance. So I mentioned before, you know, worldwide, we're up to, you know, in the hundreds of millions of people that have experienced this vaccine, we're collecting data about adverse effects in those people. And so if it seems like sometimes the guidance changes or the, you know, the information we hear, it sounds different. It's not that we didn't know what we were talking about before. It's just that this is a continuously evolving area and we're reacting to the new information as it's known. Right. It's a larger sample size. You have more information on how it affects different populations because you can't possibly study everybody. But when you get hundreds of millions of people, you're starting to get pretty close to everybody. Absolutely. Uh, so now they've got these, these larger studies, and they keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger as uh, it gets rolled out to a, a larger scale. How can people trust the data that they're seeing come from these companies? Because, you know, some people may think, hey, they, they're in the business of making money. They're going to want this data to reflect a positive product, and maybe they'll tweak something here and there. Is that possible, or how do they ensure safety? So the data that's submitted, the data package that goes forward to Health Canada for approval, as I said, is scrutinized by experts. So these are scientists that are, you know, this is what they do for a living, is scrutinize this data, apply good critical appraisal lens to it. And if the data has holes in it or if something's not cleared or the numbers don't add up right, they will go back and ask for more clarification. But even once it's approved and Health Canada's kind of given its stamp of approval and now it's available for sale in Canada, we continue to see oversight by other committees. For example, we have this National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, or NACI, that many people have probably heard about. And they're the ones that make recommendations about who should get which vaccines and how we should be administering it and so forth. And that's a panel of, again, experts, clinicians, scientists from a variety of fields. So immunology and infectious disease and pharmacology. And so these are not industry people. They're at arm's length, and they're the ones that are constantly reviewing the evidence and making recommendations and revising recommendations. And then that guidance goes to the provinces, and our chief medical officers of health will decide whether to take those recommendations at face value or whether there's something in the local context that would want them to sort of tweak those recommendations. But the other thing to be mindful of, especially as we're talking about covid the world is looking at this data and many of us that don't even sit on these committees, but are active scientists and researchers and in the medical community who are seeing patients are reacting to this data too. And, you know, when we see something that doesn't add up, we raise those red flags and we'll question it. So there's lots of eyes on this right now. That's, that's reassuring for a lot of people, I think, is that uh, they just know that, you know, it is it is validated and this has to go through such an intensive process that it's in nobody's best interest not to have the right information out there. We're talking vaccine hesitancy with Dr. Deborah Kelly, professor and researcher of pharmacy. 
We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're talking vaccine hesitancy with Dr. Deborah Kelly, professor and researcher of pharmacy. Let's get back to the interview. Now, before we get into what pharmacists are recommending, can you walk me through what the different vaccines are that we have in Canada? Sure. Well, we've got uh, basically four vaccines that are approved for use in Canada, three of them that are actually in our repertoire that we're using right now. And I'm not going to give you the brand names. Everybody's referring to them as the company names. So I'm going to call them by the company names. So we've got two that are considered mRNA vaccines. One is made by Pfizer and one of them is made by Moderna. And so these are each two dose vaccines. And then we have two other vaccine candidates that are available. One of them is made by AstraZeneca and the other one is made by Janssen or by Johnson and Johnson. They're sort of the same company. So the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is also a two dose vaccine, but it has a different technology. It it uses a type of, of not dangerous viral vector that delivers a piece of the virus, a code for us to make an immune response to the spike protein. And the other one, the the Johnson & Johnson one, is a similar type of vaccine. But the interesting thing about that one is it's only one dose. So we actually haven't received our first shipment of Johnson Johnson, as far as I'm aware, in Canada yet. So we're not using that in the provinces um, up to this point, but we should be seeing that one shortly. We do have supply of the other three, and that's what we're using in our clinics now. Right. And one of the ones we've heard a lot about is the AstraZeneca and people have been saying different concerns about it. What's the what's the story on AstraZeneca and should we be concerned about this vaccine? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing to bear in mind is COVID is really a horrible illness. It's we've got this is a pandemic. We've got serious illness. It's overflowing our medical system. Our ICUs are overflowing with people who are really sick. And even once they recover from the initial infection, we're hearing cases of people who continue to suffer from what they're calling long COVID symptoms. So I think anytime you want to talk about a drug product or a vaccine, everybody asks, is it safe? And I guess the first thing that I'll say is nothing is 100% safe in life. Driving a car is not 100% safe, though we feel pretty confident getting behind the wheel. So it all comes down to risk benefit. I'm only going to speak to the three vaccines that we actually have experienced with so far in Canada, but all three have shown 100% efficacy in preventing severe COVID infection. And that's what's really important is I would rather take a vaccine that's going to keep me out of the ICU than not take it for fear of an adverse effect that might happen, you know, in one in a million. So we are hearing reports of some adverse effects that have caused some concern with AstraZeneca. And specifically, these are blood clots associated with um, a reduction in a type of blood cell called platelets. But this is a very rare adverse effect. As I mentioned, the estimates are about one in 125,000 to one in a million. Whereas the benefit, 100% efficacy in preventing severe COVID, I would certainly not hesitate to, to take the AstraZeneca vaccine myself if I was in the age category that it's recommended for. Hmm, that makes that makes perfect sense. And, uh, and you know, with those blood clots, it was kind of a, a different than we'd expect. They were seeing it more in younger people than older people. So they're recommending it more for the senior population. Yeah. And and don't forget that COVID itself causes blood clots. So yeah. if you end up in, in ICU or in hospital with COVID, your risk of getting blood clots is about one in five yes. versus one in a million. But we think that um, they're still really studying what what this type of adverse effect Um, is all about and what causes it. Because it's so rare, it's probably a type of immune complex. There's also been some new research that came out from Pfizer talking about how children over 12 years old are showing 100% efficacy as well with this vaccine. Can you explain a little bit about the research you've heard about? So I actually haven't seen that paper yet. I've only seen the press releases um, probably that most people have seen. It's certainly very promising because, of course, you know, we're not going to achieve full protection in the population until everyone has vaccine. But it's certainly looking promising that the vaccine seems to be safe and associated with protecting against severe infection in children as well. Looking forward to seeing the data myself. 
Yes, of course. You've always got to look at that before you can understand a trial. Uh, it's one of the things we learned about in epidemiology. No one knew what an epidemiologist was until last year, but now uh, <laughs> people finally know what I do. So as a pharmacist, you know, you working with pharmacists and teaching pharmacists, what are pharmacists recommending for people about what they need to do to get the vaccine and what their behavior should be around that vaccine? Okay, so the number one message is get the vaccine. So as soon as, I mean, every province has got a slightly different rollout. So far in um, Newfoundland and Labrador, we've got a pre-registration process for different target groups. So as soon as the opportunity opens up, whether it's by age category or maybe medical condition or other risk factors or high priority groups that we're trying to get vaccinated, you can go in online and pre-register for your vaccine. And then once that happens, you'll be contacted to set up an appointment to go to one of the vaccine clinics that are available. We are anticipating the province has said that in the next phase that pharmacists will be administering vaccines so you should be able to get a vaccine at your pharmacy as well as your doctor's office too so that's not yet available in the province but we're hoping that we're going to see it very very quickly so that's the first thing is get pre-registered listen for when you can access the vaccine and get in that queue The second thing that I'll suggest is if you've got any specific concerns about your own health, that you should probably have a chat with your doctor about it beforehand. So now, um, so that when the call comes, you're not slowed down by that process. Now, I can say with confidence that the guidelines are pretty much everyone should get the vaccine, but there are some certain populations that may want to have a conversation about their own personal risk benefits. So, you know, if someone was pregnant, perhaps, or, or was trying to conceive, they may want to have that conversation. I know I fielded lots of questions from people that have immune compromise and wondering, you know, is it safe for me? And the answer is yes, for the most part, Um, we don't have real safety concerns, but maybe the immune response that you mount if you're really immune compromised may not be the same as someone who doesn't have immune compromise. And people that have autoimmune conditions, sometimes they have some concerns as well. So as I say, for the majority of individuals, the resounding recommendation is get the vaccine. But if you have concerns, contact your doctor now to have that conversation so that you can get in the queue and get your vaccine. And then when your time comes, bring your health card and wear a short sleeve shirt and a big smile. And, um, you know, the most common adverse effect we're hearing is people just feeling so elated that they finally got their first dose. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I could see that. And what about in between? Because there are boosters for some of these shots. Do we have to be careful while we're waiting for our boosters or are we just like 100 percent vaccinated? We're good to go after we get one of two shots. I'm so glad you asked that question because I think, um, in fact, I just read a statement that Dr. Tam has put out with a little bit of guidance around this just today. I think it's really important for people to remember that while the first dose does give them some protection um, and a good deal of protection, actually, against contracting severe COVID, it doesn't provide 100 percent protection against getting even a milder form of COVID infection. And so if, you know, if I get the vaccine and I get a mild form of COVID and then we're interacting, you and I, and I don't have a mask on and we're not being physically distanced, I can pass that virus on to you. And perhaps you are not able to take the vaccine or it's not your turn yet. You haven't gotten it. I could pass on the virus to you and it could cause really serious infection. And remember, we're in a pandemic. So we need to protect everyone. It's not just about our own health, but we need to look after everyone around us. And we're not really going to be in the free and clear until everyone has had their full vaccination course, whether it's the one dose of the one shot um, Johnson and Johnson vaccine or their two doses from from the other vaccines. We really need to reach that level of herd immunity. And until then, it's masks, staying distant and using good hand sanitizer and uh, all those good things we've been hearing from public health. Well, that's right. I had Dr. Fitzgerald on last week and she mirrored the same thing saying, look, guys, we still we've learned how to do all this stuff now. It's second nature. Let's continue to do this until we know everybody's in the clear and then we can reassess the situation from there. But thank you so much for taking the time today. It's so nice to hear from somebody with your expertise about all the specifics of the vaccine so that those people that really want to be informed can be informed and make the right decision for themselves, which hopefully is getting the vaccine. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for getting the information out there. Thank you to my guests for sharing this information today. 
It's an important topic with a lot of misinformation out there, so I'm glad we could share two expert opinions on the topic. Understanding the scientific process, weighing the risks and benefits, and having the right information are all important parts of making an informed decision. So I hope today's episode helped you. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.